Hello, and welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. So we're gonna have 20 minutes of craft talk and then 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys, the global audience. So now is your chance to write in to think about it. We have a brilliant guest. He's a writer, he's an actor, he's a writing coach. He's really deep, he's really intense. And I'm so excited to have Nick Job on today with us. Hello, Nick. I'm here. How you're are you? Here, I know it's the magic. We love this. I, it's so exciting to. You're in LA. I'm in New York. And I'm in, yes, I'm in Santa Monica, California. It's 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 beautiful as it often is. So you are like part of the whole tribe of multi hyphened really creative, really visionary people in the entertainment field. And coming from like looking at stories from a actor's point of view, a writer's point of view, a coach's point of view, what makes a good story? Oh, wow. That's a, oh, that's a good, oh, I didn't, you're hitting me with the questions. That's really good. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think, I think a good story has a, a really compelling goal and a really compelling obstacle or series of obstacles. And I think the more, the more the goal can be meaningful for whoever, whether it's a single person or multiple people that are going after that goal, and the more that the storyteller can let us know why that goal is meaningful, and the more we can create lots of interesting opposition, I think that that that's what makes a good a good story. But to me, it's to me it's the it's it's the way that goal makes meaning in the audience's mind that mm -hmm. really makes a story powerful and compelling. And do you find, I mean, how do you, because you're, you're, you know, such an elite writer's coach, how do you get your clients to sort of get to the heart of stories? You know, it's, I always start, you know, it feels counterintuitive because I think people, they really just want to jump in, you know, they want to start outlining and they want to start, they want to start getting to pages. You know, I feel like, you know, my clients are always like, when are we going to get to pages? But I always really try and get to this sort of signature I just feel like everyone has this sort of key, like there's this really fine theme inside of everybody that they're, and sometimes it's a, it's a group of themes. So I really try and get to that, you know, this idea of like this plot of land, this really specific theme first. And then it's like, can we find a concept that matches this thing that is so true and so unique to you? Because I really find that a lot of writers, like they know what's meaningful to them, but they somehow can't make it match a story. So that's sort of the beginning of the work is, is finding out really, like, what do I want to say? Like, first thing people always ask me, like, what do I do just starting writing? And I'm like, just, just write down notes about what's important to you, what's meaningful to you, like, whether it's current events or things in your family mm -hmm. life. So I always try and start from the super personal. Um, so it sounds like you're saying, like, no one's boring basically, no, because, no. because everyone, it seems like there's a lot of surfaces that one has to get through to get to the good stuff though. It, the good stuff. I, I always say, what is the sub basement below the sub basement? Like there's mm -hmm. something beneath there. And people who say they're boring are usually the most interesting people. That's like a cover for right. them having something really deep and powerful to say. And can you tell, like, are you like in the first 10 pages, because obviously you read a lot of scripts, what, what's wrong with it or what's not there? Is that really show up in the first 10 pages? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I do read a lot of scripts. I you know, read for production companies and companies that, that give coverage. And, um, you know, I think sometimes there's there's two things in those in those first 10 that are, are sort of an alert, either a red or a green flag for me. Sometimes the execution is off and you can feel that right away, meaning that first scene that they've presented to us, it's just not compelling enough. Mm -hmm. But the voice is there and the atmosphere is there. And I'm like, ooh, this person has voice. They can, there's, there's something atmospheric here, but the, but, the, but the execution is just not, whatever I'm seeing, there's not a strong enough question. I'm just not that compelled. And then sometimes the execution is incredible. They present a scene to me that I really want to know the answer to, you know, create a, they, they give a taste of a mythology that I need to know more about, but there's not as much voice. There's not as much, there's, there's not as much like 
like life in, in breath, breath in on the pages. And what do you consider like voice? Like, what is that to you, you think? Well, you know, I, the way I always learned it is you can use the, the, you know, below the slug line and, and where you describe the scene to, to insert, to insert voice. I mean, you can, you can put voice in the characters, but I think the way you describe a scene is really your chance. I mean, look, I always think a script is just a conversation between you and an audience. And it's mm. just the story itself is just the, it's the conversation, but I think you can, you can sneak voice into all those little descriptive action lines. You know, it's, you know, again, it's it's the way we you see things differently than I see things. So show me as you talk about your world how you see the world. That's really great because not coming from not being really a writer, like being a force writer at times, I love the idea that it's a conversation. And then you're just storytelling around the campfire and trying to make people have a reaction. Yeah. I mean, I've just been saying more and more to my clients and everybody that I really think. You know, because we're in this age, right, of of all of these starring showrunners, people who create shows and star of them, you know, Phoebe Waller-Bridge and, you know, all, all these people, Donald Glover, and they really just have things they want to say to an audience and they're thought leaders, you know, they want to have a conversation about something. So they go, let me write a pilot that is that conversation. I think if you think of it that way, it's completely different than what's going to catch someone's eye. What's like gimmicky. What's a cool mm -hmm. set piece. Like first, like, what do I want to, what's the talk I want to have with my audience and how do I create a story that is the vehicle for that talk? That's really interesting. That is super interesting. Are you seeing like, because you have a great eye view for being an, from the actor and from, you know, coaching, are there themes right in the zeitgeist now that are coming up a lot? You're like, wow, I read this script and then I read that script. And I mean, I think more than anything, there is all this transparency about mental health. Oh, you know, interesting. There's this, there's this real thing about people really wanting to say in a in an unfettered way how they're feeling, even if it feels yucky and scary and imperfect. And so that's why I think so many pieces at some level there this there's this exploration of identity and self and especially you know with with covid and everything going on i mean i think we all had to kind of go inwards and so there's this intense expression of like you know everybody a lot of people had dealt with mental health stuff around that so i just think more and more there's there's all these really cool conceptual ways that people are presenting their own mental health journeys. I don't want to say struggles because not everyone had a struggle, but mental health journeys. Are you seeing that come up in roles that you're coming up for, like scripts you're reading as an actor? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. I, uh, I think, I think again, I think that what I'm sort of feeling and auditioning for, like Hollywood, you know, we're we're finding new frontiers of escapism, you know, and and for I, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I think again, cowboys are in the zeitgeist. I don't know if it's because everybody decided they wanted to leave their metropolitan area and go live in the wilderness somewhere, but it feels like the frontier is in the zeitgeist again. Um, the, the 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 old west, the new west, uh, mm -hmm. these explorations of like. Our, our primal side seem to be really in the zeitgeist. Yeah, it's it may be less succession, but maybe that is primal because that's edible. But like, right? But but um, outer range and stuff like that. That's outer range. Yeah, my favorite, my my current favorite. Outer yeah, range. that's that is really good. So, has your writing and being a writer informed your acting, and has act your acting informed your writing? Yeah, I mean, I think it was always a goal, you know, like when I when I was in New York many years ago, I was like, okay, I, you know, like a lot of people think, okay, I need to study with the best teachers. Did mm -hmm. that for a long time. And then I was, and then I was like, okay, I want to write. And then I'm like, okay, I need to study with the best teachers. Did that. And I think for me, it was like, how can I understand the full kitten, how it all fits? I need to know for me, I'm such a how guy. I have such a science mind. I need to know how it all fits together. So yeah, I mean, the way I describe conflict, writing conflict to my clients, I know, you know, people, people, actors often say like, oh, I can really sink my teeth into this scene when they pick up a scene. And again, 
I think people who can write really compelling conflict, that's the feeling you get, you know? So if you can write that conflict where we're like, okay, who's going to, I have no clue who's going to win this conflict. It's the same thing when you play it as an actor, it's super engaging, something to get your shoulder behind, so to speak. And where, where do you think the drive to become a storyteller came from? Oh, um, well, I was a latchkey kid in the eighties with an only child. So I had a lot of free time and stories were, you know, how I just got by I, my, I had to go deep into my imagination and create, you know, I used to, like, you know, God bless my mom. We, she, she let me draw my, the walls of my room when I was a kid, like when I was mm-hmm. eight or nine and, and I just had to just go really deep into my, into my imaginative life to, you know, I didn't have brothers and sisters to fill up the time. And, um, and I also think for me, you know, I talked about mental health, mental health is something I talk about a lot, the journey inward in terms of who am I, why do I do what I do? That's why I've always loved mysteries. Mm-hmm. There's just this endless mystery of self that I'm, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm just constantly unraveling. And that's always been a part of everything I've ever written. And when did acting become sort of like something for you? Well, I always needed attention. <laughs> always, <laughs> You're an only kid, of course. I was just like, hey, you know, can you watch this cannonball? Somebody, can everybody watch it? <laughs> you know, I just, it, 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 when I came to terms with the fact that I needed just really, you know, l- l- let's not, let's say it how it is. I, I wanted my mother and father to see me, be mm-hmm. seen, you know? Mm-hmm. Once I came to terms with that, sort of early in my acting journey, I started to realize this other piece, which was like, it was, it was the acting could be this vehicle of, of service and like moving people. You know, when, when we watch something, you know, you mentioned Secession, we, when we watch these great shows or a great episode, we're changed. We, we, it changes us. We think right. about things differently. So I think acting, there was two things that happened. I realized that I could touch and move people Mm -hmm. And I realized I could learn more and more about myself and accepting myself through the craft of acting. There must be such a thrill to step into another, really step into another character and and live someone else's existence for a bit. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's it's like if you're teaching acting 101, you just say, well, you pretended when you were a kid, all we're doing is pretending, right? At a much higher level. Like, yeah, it's... um, it's great. There's no, you know, I always talk about like when I do a show or I get a job, like I go out there and I'm nervous and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, run the lines. And then I get on set and all of a sudden, as soon as I get there and the cameras roll, I just, I'm like, mm, this is like where I'm supposed to be. And it just mm-hmm. feels like pretending like when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. A hundred percent. So Zach, let's play the, um, this great, uh, real clip of some of, um, Nick's acting, and I want to ask you a couple questions about the stuff we're looking at. Okay, cool. Some older stuff on here. Not for me. (laughs) Oh. You can perform? Fucking right I can. Come back to my office and try me. Never had any complaints. (laughs) You know, they say a trained professional can always tell when someone's lying. That's an exaggeration, we don't always know. But right now I do. You're lying. What? Did you know what's wrong with that? My mother was nothing but a whore. You would talk about your own mother that way? The woman who gave you life? You ungrateful bastard! I ought to cut your balls off! Do it, you fucking junk dealer. I'll still be the better man. Honey. Claudia, we're about to eat. Come over here. It's 7.30, dinner time. It doesn't have to be. Would you please get off of the table? You can have me right now. Later, sweetie, like normal. Be a doll and set the table. Honey. This is Philip. Yeah, it's all in hand. I CC'd you. Well, what do you want me to do? Honey. Slam his head against the stove until he stopped moving. Tina was his mother. I came here to tell her. 
Jesus. First thing tomorrow. What about the baby? That's up to you. He would be smarter, powerful, cast a wide net. You tried to get in the way. You didn't even know who you were chasing. You let me down, Danny. All right, look at that. Yeah, that's some fun stuff. We got new stuff coming too. That's some good fun stuff though. That was, that was fun. Of those things that we saw, what um, what still gives you a little bit of a like a thrill looking at? Well, the last one is a film that we made, the first short film I ever made, mm. and with my friend Robert Ferrier. And you know, Robert's been in a number of things since we shot that. And great actor, but you know, the the I you know we ran a Kickstarter, raised bunch of money and you know we shot a big old short film so it that that always was that was really cool you know it was like I was trying to do it was like I, I was looking at all these you know looking at all these movies at the time like usual suspects I'm like I want to do something real twisty and crimey and and it, it, yeah it just it's cool it takes me back you know made a couple shorts there but um you know it's always fun to watch that mank scene too because of how much went into it you know, Fincher is like, uh, no, not, I don't know if that's a notorious, uh, David, you're great. I love you. Um, but like he, lots of takes, right? So we did that. I don't know. Every setup had like, I don't know, maybe 30 takes in each setup. So all angles and, um, and he doesn't like to use stud players. So I was taking so many, prat no one really asked me, like, can you do Pratt Falls? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do some Pratt. And I was taking just Pratt Fall after Pratt Fall. And my, the pants, my pants started ripping. And he was right. like, oh, in the costume. And he's like, yo, what's going on? These aren't breakaway. You know what? <laughs> you know, so I'm like, they're changing pants. I'm taking fall. My knees are getting, <laughs> just, you know, and, 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 you know, we did another scene and, you know, Gary was talking, I was talking to Gary Ullman and, and Gary was like, yeah, this is the thing. It's like, you know, 30 to 40 in each setup. And I was like, oh my gosh. So did you find, I mean, I've heard Fincher speak and stuff about that. Did you find that after, his theory is that after a certain amount of takes that the, the actor will finally drop doing any stick or anything they brought in and be so worn down that they'll just be really in the moment. Was what was was that your experience? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because you're, you know, you got a scene there and, you know, you got, Tom and Gary and, and, you know, Arliss and everyone, and you got all these big players and, you know, you, you had a set, they don't show it, but there was a section of this standoff between me and Arliss and, um, you know, the way they cut it and you're nervous, you're, you're, ner you're, you know, Fincher's there, Messerschmitt is there, <laughs> you're nervous. And, um, and yeah, you do it enough times that it's like, uh, and he gave me, you know, it's a really pretty quick scene. And I had another little section, but it's a quick scene, but he gave me tons of notes, tons. He'd come out and he'd go, Nick, Nick. He, he, he was like, why don't we do it this way, do it this way. So yeah, I think it, I think it breaks you down to where you're, yeah, you're not, I would like to think I'm not doing too much shtick anyway, but yeah, I think it breaks you down to where you're just, just saying the lines like a person. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. What, um. Uh, you know, obviously I come from being a, a director and a filmmaker. So I'm always curious about your um, actors experiences with directors and what makes a great experience and what makes maybe a less than great experience. Well, I think that, um, you know, you know, again, like, like in, in the mediums of TV and film, you're not going to get as much communication, obviously, as you would in the medium of theater, right? So the communication is is you have to do a lot of your own work and a lot of your own, um, uh, you know, setting it up, getting yourself prepared. But, but I, you know, I just did uh, an episode of Yellowstone with Stephen Kay, and um, he had just the, the the right amount of notes, you know, and 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 really, it was to your point about David. It was it was very it was very similar to I think you can do less, like I think you can do less here. So, I think what is a good feeling when you come on on a tv or or a tv show or film is that it really feels like the, the director has a real eye for exactly what he wants you know in in all phases and again so much of what david's doing has little to do with the actors and so much to do with the light and you know shaping the light and things of that nature but 
you know, the director is, 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 is in that scenario, God, and you want a prepared God with a really good eye for, you know, you know, as they say in Hamlet, you know, looking before and after really, really being able to see how all parts work together. Um, Have you ever had a, like a sort of a mutiny of actors like if the director's not pulling it together? Yeah, I don't know if I've ever had that experience. No, I, I I don't think I've had that experience. And we've done, you know, I've made a lot of shorts with friends. And and I think that, you know, again, mutual, there's a lot of mutual respect. Um, and no matter what the production is, all levels, I try and just always come with like, you know, let me be of service. Let me put my ego aside, you know, whatever they need. You know, I've had lines cut right before scenes before. And you just got to be like, okay, this is just going to go just be I'm just, just going to make everyone's day easier that's always my goal let me just make this day fast and easy for everybody what um do you have any mentors uh yeah I have a writing mentor uh, a friend of mine who's a showrunner he's kind of a mentor to me um uh his name is Matt Arnold yeah he's he's been he's been just really good you know we kind of like we piece together a pitch together he's talked to me a lot about how he pitches and um it's a lot of kind of what I've like brought to my clients, but uh, yeah, he's been great um, on the acting front. You know, I think that the, the teachers that I had when I was in New York, you know, the great teachers, mm -hmm. uh, obviously Larry Moss, who everybody knows, and his protege in New York, Carl, Carl Beery, who I wor worked with for a long time. Those guys were great, you know, teachers and mentors and you know, I, I I think great actor training is really just getting to know yourself. So they helped me get to know myself better. Mm -hmm. um, Funny, I sat in on a Larry Moss class as a director once, and I was like, oh, his goal is to make every, all, all the actors cry. At some point in the, in each scene, someone would be crying. Yeah, he sees you. Re he really, it's really confronting. You mm -hmm. know, because again, like the old cliche is he tells everybody to go to therapy, right? That's the old cliche. Okay. But but he kind of tells you why to go to therapy, you know, like he'll be like, uh, the, the old thing I think is like, what is between you and this character? Like, why can't we get to the work? There's something in between where you are now and the work. And we got to deal with that so we can kind of get to the work and, you know, get to the character, whether that's, you know, I, I remember doing scenes with Larry and having to do real antisocial characters. And, and him being like, that's really good for you because you're super identified with people pleasing, you know, mm -hmm. all these things. So it's good to work on some some dark antisocial characters. That's great. That's great when you have someone who's really, and I'm sure, you know, coaching, like seeing you and seeing your where you could go, like elevating you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, I honestly, if there's any gift that was given to me by the universe, whatever, that I think has helped me a lot is that I'm just teachable enough that the important lessons get through. I still got that resistance and that ego and like, oh, I know, but I was just teachable enough that the really important lessons snuck through. Wow, that's great. So we have a bunch of questions here. So I'm just gonna drill into a couple of them. Um, Fernando asks, when, when writing a script, what's more important, a great idea, the what or the execution, the how? Uh, parse that for me oh. so when writing a script is it more is a great idea more important than the execution mm. like if it's a great idea but it's written like a crappy and misspelled. yeah thanks fernando for that question that's a great question um you know i've heard said before for up and coming writers like keep your plot move simple and really focus on deepening character and really really executing so you know i think there's a there's a uh, there's a gradient to um, high degrees of difficulty. So I think especially, you know, my mentor says to me, he goes, you never want anybody to read your first two or three or four scripts in this town. Like you want them to read like your 13th script. Mm. So I think that, um, or your 14th script. I think that if you can keep your plot moves simple and you can really focus and uh, plot moves that are engaging and, and meaningful and don't confuse people, and you can focus on character and depth and execution early, I think that can be really good. And again, like I said, you know, sometimes you read those scripts where the moves are not like wow moves, but the atmosphere 
and the voice. And you can feel this writer has something to say. Like to me, especially from all the people, you know, that I know on the, the representation side, like sometimes that's way more important. You know, sometimes you read something, I'll read something and I'm like, this script was messy and there's an, they didn't pay this off. They set this up and I'm like, there's something here. Like there's this person saying something like they got mm -hmm. a unique view of the world that I want to know more about. That's great. Very helpful. Okay. On the other hand, Elisabetta asks, I want to be an actress. How do I discover myself? How do I find out what type of acting is good for me? For example, mm -hmm. drama, comedy. Um, that's what she wants to know. What's the name again? Her name is Elisabetta. Elisabetta. Thanks, Elisabetta. Elisabetta for your question. Um, man, what, what, I don't know, what fuels you, what inspires you when you see it, you know, when you watch it, what, you know, there's scenes, like there's a couple scenes in, and I don't know what season, but there's a couple scenes in, in Ozark where I watch something Jason Bateman's doing. I, and I listen to the dialogue and I'm like, man, this is, I want to do stuff like this, man. Mm. This is deep. It's about family and stakes and and being a man and a family and like wow so I would look for those those themes like when you're watching tv or going to the theater like ooh, that feels like me like and honestly it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a tryout you know like what is it that's really exciting you what's really moving you um that I, that, that to me is you know again like really go, go where it feels like you you have Again, no one is telling us to be actors. In fact, people are telling us not to be actors. <laughs> so um, you gotta, you gotta really, you know. Again, every time I want out of this acting game, like mm -hmm. again, I'll see a scene on a show like Ozark or a smart show like, uh, you know, Outer Range or whatever, and I'm like, oh, I want to play a scene like that. Mm -hmm. I haven't played it yet. So you know, again, like that, it's gotta you got to want it real bad. So look for that stuff that make, gives you that feeling. Oh, I want to do that. And maybe it is comedy, you know, maybe it's comedy, maybe it's voiceover or animation. Some people that really fires up. Do you find like, do you put yourself out there as I can do comedy? I can do drama. Is, is, is that something one as an actor needs to do, or does one have to like, <laughs> pigeonhole themselves? I wanted to pigeonhole myself, but it still seems like the industry will help to pigeonhole you. Like, you know, I, I get called in a lot, quite frankly, for arrogant, uh, can I say douchebags? I get called in for arrogant jerks a lot. I can do a lot of other things, but it's really, I could never have pegged myself as that because I think of myself as not that, really kind, right. and, you know, magnanimous, mm -hmm. all those things. So I didn't know, but then, you know, I can, do, I, there's something I can do. I can play this sort of like status and power. And, you know, a friend of mine came to see me and I did, uh, we did a reading of Oleana, the great mammoth play. And my friend saw it and he goes, you do condescending better than any actor I've ever seen. And I, and I really took, I, wow. I had to hear him say that to go, oh, I should, I should listen to that. So I think it's a balance between our inner compass and also adjusting to some of the feedback we get. Doesn't mean we let other people be our guides, but we let what they say help help shape our own inner guidance. Well, I mean, do you, are you like, so for now are you like leaning into sort of the, uh, that type of um, master of the universe thing? Even yeah, if you could do mean, sort of like the more wacky comedy? You know, I think, again, I, I think there's a thing I do, quite frankly, that often is like a character who thinks they're very serious, but it's a little bit funny. Mm -hmm. but, and I did, you know, and that's kind of how I am. I take things very seriously. And sometimes that's funny, you know, and I didn't know that until, you know, a decade of therapy. I mean, you know, that's part of the like inner work, outer work stuff, you know, like, okay, I'm going to get some feedback and then I'm going to do me a little bit and mm -hmm. learn more about myself. Um, so yeah, I, like I just signed with new, new managers. And I, re, when I came to that meeting, I knew, it was, I, I was like, I know how to pitch me. Like, I know what, what the casting directors in, in both coasts see me as, and I know how we can exploit that. And it took sort of until now to get there. It takes a while. That is great. That is great. And, and and it seems to me that making your job easier for your management is part of your job. 
Yeah, I mean, they say they only take 10 or 15%, you do 85 or 90% of the work. I mean, you know, and for me, the work is getting to know more producers and showrunners and writers through my other side of my world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really just like just making friends with people. It's it's almost like not even asking anybody for anything, just like getting engaged with people, getting involved with people. You know, every time I write to someone in my industry who's higher up than me, I always say, hey, I just watched your new thing. Love mm -hmm. what you were doing with this. You know, just like just showing a little bit of interest in other people really goes a long way. And to me, that's kind of what networking is. A hundred percent. I was going to say like that. It's funny when you listen to conversations about networking now, it's, it's literally about not having a goal and connecting. They're like, connect. The goal will come out at some point. And, and which inherently talks about the long game of the industry. Yeah. The, with my mentor who uh, has sold a number of shows, we had been talking for three years and during the pandemic, we were on a phone call and he said, hey, man, I don't have anything going right now. You want to pitch me any ideas? And I had never thought this moment was ever coming. Right. And so I had like three or four things. I was like, I got this thing and I got this thing. And one of them, he was like, oh, I really like that. Tell me more. And so that was the thing that we ended up breaking as a pitch. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll take it out at some point, but never thought that moment was going to come. And, you know, also sort of have a a thing where there may be an opportunity to get into one of his rooms at some point. But again, that was never like, I was never angling for that. It was just, just talking to him. You know, we grew up in it. We went to high school in the same town. You know, we liked, we both liked similar high concept things. And so we had this, I'd be like, did you watch this? And he's like, yeah, did you watch this? And then one day he was like, you have anything you want to pitch me? It would never would have worked if I would have been like, Hey, when can I pitch you some stuff? You know, it just, it, it was organic. But uh, my question is, though, then how does one, you know, do the goal structure? Like, you know, still have like the agenda of like, I'm going to go chop wood, carry water and move my career forward. I mean, you just, you, you know, I think you try and in a way that is somewhat altruistic, find people who are like minded, you know, find people who mm -hmm. like the things you like. I think that's the first thing yeah. they like you like. And then let them know, let them know in conversation. These are my goals. You know, at some point in the process of constructing that pitch, he said to me, okay, I'm about to run some of these by some of my people who are close to me in the industry. Like, what, what do you want? So I know, like, what right. do you want? Right. And I, for me, I was like, I, you know, I want to, I, I, for me, I want to show run and I want to be in it, you know, or co-show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's just eventually, maybe it's not today, maybe it's not this project, but uh, just let them know. You don't have to let them know, like, can you help me do that today? But just right. so you know, in our conversations, this is where I'd like us to go. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think earlier in my career, I felt like you had to like take, you know, be more aggressive about it. And I think that was, was an older model also. Yeah, there's that model. I think the thing, look, here's the, here's the, here's the chaotic part. There's really no right way. There's a lot of different ways, you know, 100%. and sometimes the aggression, the aggressive route sometimes does let people know that you're really, you believe in yourself a lot and you're very mm -hmm. self-possessed, but especially in our industry where, you know, people who are showrunners just get hundreds of emails every day. Hey, do you need a showrunner's PA? You, you know, do you need an assistant? Do you need someone on your staff? Like, you know, again, I, I know people who are involved with a show I really like. I just dropped one a line the other day. Hey, man, I love this episode. Really reminded me of, um, you know, it's a, it's a show about sports. And I have my family worked in pro sports. So I said, really reminded me of growing up in pro sports. Hope you're amazing. He wrote right back. So good to hear from you. Hope you're well. That's great. You're doing this project. I mean, to me, that's, you know, my we call them touches. Like, those are nice, gentle touches. Like, hey, I'm alive. I'm doing work. Maybe someday we'll work together. Totally, keeping in the zeitgeist. Um, yeah. Christina has a very good question. What is the best advice you were given when you first started out in the industry? Um, the best advice I was given. Yeah, that is a good question. I don't. Okay. Oh, that's good. I have a great one. Um, I was at the Super Bowl party in the year 2000. My mother works in pro sports. And Vince Vaughn was there. He'll never remember this. And uh, and I went up to him. I was like, I think, yeah, I was 20, I was 19. I was like, I really want to be an actor. 
He said something, this is paraphrasing heavily, it was a long time ago. He said, um, don't ever quit and don't ever stop. Don't ever quit. It took me seven years to even get one job at the lowest level in this business. So just don't let anybody ever talk you off of your, off of your goal. Like just, just tenacious persistence, you know, don't let time or the, the idea of failing set you back. Just keep going. And, you know, that's, someone says something like that. Of course, you know, what he was sort of already becoming, you don't forget it. That's an amazing, I would have not expect it, especially after Vince, like you wouldn't think Vince Vaughn would be so heavily committed because he I played. Heard, yeah, right. I forgot I had that Vince Vaughn anecdote there in the back of my brain somewhere. It came out, per, I didn't even know when that's thinking amazing. of anecdotes, I didn't even know I had that one. That's really good. And is there, what's advice that you give now when you have younger actors come, or not younger, just people come up to you and be like, how do I, and you know. I mean, to me, the journey to becoming a better actor is just it's really just more and more and more self-acceptance. You know, Anthony Hopkins, they talk to him about like, how'd you get so good? And he says, you know, I don't know how long I'm paraphrasing heavily, but he talks about his time being in AA, you know, sitting in, in folding chairs, you know, listening to other people and their lives. And people talk about getting great, you know, going to therapy like and I think that's why Larry suggests therapy. I just think the more you know and accept, you know, Carl used to always say, fall in love with your imperfections. You know, like mm -hmm. the more you can just deeply accept yourself, your limitations, your gifts. And yeah, aging helps with it. But I think you can get there faster through a lot of these modalities that I've suggested. Like just, you know, know thyself. And, and I think that's a never ending journey. I really think young actors think, okay, if I just get really in great shape, fix my teeth, get super hot, whatever, like meet a lot of folks, it's going to happen. And I really feel like the counterintuitive thing is the deeper I go inwards, the more I learn to really accept who I am on a super deep level and mm -hmm. know who I am. To me, that's how you you just get great. You know, you just stand in front of the camera and you're just you, like the fullness of you. That is really beautiful. Nick, this has been so fun and we are at time. Okay. This has been amazing. Where can people find you if they want to take, you know, find you out? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you want to coach with me, I always do like an intro session. You can go to page1tv.com and check out my website or nick at page1tv.com. You can send me an email and just kind of hear about what I do. Uh, my, my actor website is nickjob.com. It probably needs to be updated. Um, but those are sort of the two major places. And yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be on a couple episodes of things coming up. Like I said, I'll be on an episode of Yellowstone in the fall and there's a new HBO Max pilot I did that hopefully will drop soon. I had a great, great couple moments in that show. So, um, yeah. Well, this was amazing. You are, uh, oh, thank you, Zach, putting up your uh, info. Um, you're amazing. And like, what a light, what a light. The, the industry is lucky to have you. Thanks, Liz. This was great. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you, New York Film Academy for presenting the 2020 series. Everyone stay safe and stay cool.